Good evening. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Irene Zare, TJ Zare. My name's Amy McDonald, the director of City Space. Thanks for coming out. Um, there was a little confusion. I think some people thought they started 6.30 and then we started 7. This is the first time that's happened, so I apologize. We're going to wrap up in about 45 minutes uh, the conversation. We have a red and white wines suggested by TJ and Hadley. He will explain about these wines, which will serve along with the most amazing charcuterie. So um, I hope you still have a little appetite. We'll give a little bit more time for the reception. Um, TJ's wife, Hadley, was unable to join us tonight, but we are lucky to have TJ, who will be in conversation with our curated cuisine interlocutor and James Beard award-winning chef Irene Lee. And they're going to talk about their successful business, the Urban Grape, their approach to wine, their commitment to diversity. We also have their book out in the lobby with our wonderful independent bookstore, Brookline Booksmith. And TJ would be happy to sign copies. I've already just flipped through it, and I am definitely buying a copy the minute this is over. Um, take it away, Irene and TJ. Thank you so much. Hashtag quiz cur curated. Is it up there? Cuisine. Hashtag cuisine. Thank you. Hashtag cuisine. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you everyone um, for joining us tonight. This is a real treat for me because I have known TJ and his wife Hadley for about 10 years. Um, so thank you for coming to our reunion with each other after COVID. Um, and it's so great to see you, TJ. Yeah, it's nice to see you. We've been in the green room for about 90 minutes talking. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Good. So nice to see we, you again. We don't have anything left to talk about. <laughs> but, oh, good night. Um, thank you. Has anyone here been to the Urban Grape before? Okay, great. So we have some folks who have been and we have some folks who, who are new. Can you just give us a little bit of background on the Urban Grape? Yeah, sure. So um, thank you all for, for coming tonight. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, the Urban Grape, we started in 2010 in Chestnut Hill after uh, about 15 years uh, in the restaurant industry and uh, in distribution. And I sold to stores and restaurants. And I wanted to uh, open up the Urban Grape and create a space. Originally, it was called Itavola. Uh, we were, I was on this big Italian kick. And I wanted to create something called The Table, right? Because community is built around the table. And I wanted to create a space um, that helped build community uh, through my platform, which was beverage. And I wanted to help take the intimidation out of wine. So our first store was in Chestnut Hill in 2010. Uh, we opened up our current location uh, in 2012 and realized that we could go a lot deeper into our mission and our cause and what we wanted to do in this industry if we got rid of the first store um, and went deeper into what we can do in, uh, in the South End. So uh, we sold the first store in 2015 and uh, just celebrated. Actually, it wasn't even a celebration. I think it was... Uh, September 21st, I think that was a Friday, and I got home at night, crazy day, Hadley was picking up the kids, and I said, hey, sweets, I, I, th I think we opened up the Urban Grape 10 years ago today. She's like, all right, um, Game of Thrones. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, that was kind of it. So that's where we are right now, and we'll get into, into more of it, but that's where the Urban Grape is today and how we started. And I think one of the things that the Urban Grape is most famous for, or was famous for especially early on, was the progressive yeah. wine rating system. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so this started, uh, it's called now the progressive scale, but uh, when I was in the restaurant, I ran a restaurant called Armani Cafe on Newberry Street for a few years as uh, general manager and, uh, and wine director. And for those of you who remembered, it's now Zara, um, right next to Nike Town. So we had an awesome patio. We would compete with with Sansi and, and Steph's, and I think 29 Newberry got the sun first. So we always kind of competed with who had the best patio and the fullest patio. Ours was definitely the largest, but because we were so focused um, and our revenue for Giorgio Armani and Aquitaine Group was so focused on um, the, the 100 tables out there, it was all very seasonal. And so therefore, we had a very seasonal staff. And with seasonal staff, you only have so long to train them. And uh, I created the Progressive Scale, which wasn't called Progressive Scale back then, uh, because this is the way that I learned about wine. Besides the two levels that I took at the Elizabeth Bishop School uh, in the Met College, um, 
I learned about wine from a book called The um, uh, Windows on the World from a gentleman named Kevin Zraeli. And Windows on the World was the restaurant on the top of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. And uh, he described wine after all the books that I read, like The Wine Almanac and The Atlas of Wine and all these crazy books that just focused on uh, memorization. Uh, this one I actually understood and he talked about um, two things what made wine really approachable and easy to understand uh, body viscosity and so he put it in terms of milk products because we all understand milk right the viscosity of skim milk whole milk and heavy cream and I'm like oh I totally understand it light medium full-bodied right I understand that and then and for level, the lactose intolerant among us I'm sure there's yeah some so analog. like light almond milk and something else okay, yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it comes from these like thing, these these cows right uh, and then the other side would be acidity so when you think about acidity, there's a spectrum, and the spectrum that Kevin did was uh, lemonade and hot chocolate, okay? You like them both, but for different reasons, and you simplified it, right? Milk products, body, and lemonade and hot chocolate for acid levels, right? You're gonna drink something different after a tennis, tennis match in August than you will in front of a fireplace in February if you live on the East Coast, right? It's not that you don't like lemonade, it's just that you don't want lemonade in February sitting in front of a fireplace. So I took that and I said, huh, you know what, I really understand that. And so when I was taking my classes here, I was thinking about wine in this kind of progression of light to medium, full bodied, high acid, low acid. And back to my staff, I, a great way to train my staff because too many times I heard uh, the most important person in, in the room or at the restaurant was the guest. Right, the the customer sitting at the table. We want the you know the whole dining experience, and when the guests would ask a question about the wine, the server who wanted to bring them a great experience lied to them, and they said, "Oh, it's really good." That server's never had that wine before, right? That server is 22 years old and doesn't drink wine, right? Uh, and they're only working with us for 100 days, so. I created something, because that was like fingernails on a chalkboard. You're lying to the customer, they're not gonna have a good experience, and if it's wrong, they're really not gonna have a, a, a good experience. So I created something called a progressive wine list. And very few of us in the country did this, mostly like in LA and New York, and then this is just the way that I thought about it, where I designed the wine from light-bodied to full-bodied, from the top of the menu to the bottom of the menu. And it seems kind of like, out there, but it simplified it, right? Because when you look at a food menu, most food menus are written progressively. They start light-bodied foods, high acid, sometimes chilled, and then you go down to your, you know, your 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 grains and your proteins, and then you finish. So what I did is I, I taught the the team, my staff there, to understand the system of the wine list as opposed to trying to memorize each individual wine, which I knew they couldn't do. So this set them up for an opportunity for success. And basically the foods at the top of the menu based on your palate went with the wines at the top of the menu because, and the staff had that because. And instantly, instantly, like within a week, they tripled their sales, tripled their tips, right? Um, and everyone was happy and most importantly, the people at the table got the right answer because when you said, or when you asked the question, how is that wine? The server was honest. You know what, I haven't had that wine before, but the way that our wine list is designed is that these at the top of the menu go with this because. And people are like, oh, cool, I trust you. Let's, let's, let's have some fun. And they continued that for a really long time. And so how does that, uh, tell us about how the store looks based on that yeah. system. So um, that's a good question right there. This is a nice little lead. So I mentioned it started at the top of the menu, went to the bottom. So the progressive scale is really the progressive wine list flipped on its side. And I added numbers one through 10 to make it even easier. So the wines that are one and two are like skim milk on your palate, very light and viscosity. And you know, pre-COVID, I would taste about 6,000 wines a year, drink a lot of tequila when I get home to to you know, get the flavor of wine out of my mouth, but I would taste 6,000 wines a year and my staff would taste a few thousand. And where we take that, that number that is this a three on our scale, on a progressive scale, um, is on that very front palate. So I take a sip and before anything else kicks in, uh, like tannin in the back, or if I think about flavor or price or review, I think about what does this feel like on my palate and I talk to the staff and we figure that out in under a minute and we relate it to them on the wall and that way the system always stays correct. So the progressive scale at the Urban Grape uh, from left to right, it goes one through 10, light body to full body and then low price point, high price point. We're very like kid and dog friendly. So that's why all the, uh, the, lower, the value, you know, the Tuesday night wines, we always go Tuesday, don't we? The Tuesday night wines are always on the, gonna be on the bottom shelf, but 
Yeah, you can always find something for yourself there. I love that. And I'm someone, despite being a chef, I, I know almost nothing about wine, but I know what kind of body of wine yeah. I typically like, and I know how much I want to spend. Uh, yeah. My spouse, on the other hand, is the Completely different yep. from that. He knows all the regions. He memorized all the stuff from <laughs> Windows on the World. But I think that for me, as someone who was trying to learn about wine, it was so cool that I could just go to a spot on the wall and say to myself, all right, I'm probably going to like everything yeah. here. And it doesn't matter what region it's from. And so I got to explore so much more than kind of pigeonholing myself to a region or a grape. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm, I'm going to lean please, into yeah. that because, you know, we as, as consumers are trained by the marketing people to put blinders on you, right? We only want you to buy our wine. We're going to spend big money on collecting data to understand that this demographic of five foot two women who are right handed, that wear their purse on the right hand, that the wine needs to go here on the cooler shelf with the left hinge, because if you open it up, you don't want your purse falling off. Right? That's how wine is sold and put in stores. That's the, that's the Gallo way. That's what Gallo does, right? They train that every wine in that store is set there specifically. I mean, they do it in grocery stores, right? Like, you know, Captain Crunch is at a certain eye level for a reason, right? And it's the same thing. And I think that's just such an unfair way to sell and to learn, most importantly. And so when you, when our, our first day when we opened up the Urban Grape in Chestnut Hill in 2010, uh, we had this, uh, this couple, I, I say they're older, but they're probably my age now, or, or I, I'm their age now. Um, they're sitting at the wall and uh, I walked in, they came in, I'm like, because are our first customers, we're so happy. She's like, yeah, you know, we heard you're opening up, so we, you know, we wanted to come by. And you know, the, you know, the husband's just like going over to look at the bourbon and she's looking at the wall and she goes, how are you set up here? Like, where's the California section? So I quickly explain, you know, it's set up by the body on the scale of one to 10. And she goes, oh, this is really interesting. And I said, is interesting good? You know, I mean, this is, you know, your customer number one here. And, uh, and then she starts pointing at the wall in this certain section, let's call it the five section. And she goes, oh, you know, honey, we like this wine. We like this wine. We like, who knew that we were a 5W? Five w so the, the W is for white and, and R is for red. And so automatically that was like the validation that I was hoping for that she didn't know why she liked the wines that she liked. But at the Urban Grape, that medium bodied wine with high acid and you know, uh, you know, kind of a fuller body on there, um, she really understood. And then within that, we could get her the $100 bottle or we can get her the $15 bottle based on the height. I love that there are so many different ways that you can kind of slice the dimensions around this product. I'm curious, um, because you started to talk a little bit about marketing, um, I really like sweet wine. And I feel like the world tells me all the time that I'm not supposed to. I love Riesling, like high acid, pretty sweet Riesling. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how kind of taste maybe broadly and with wine specifically has been kind of gendered and racialized and how, you know, I often feel like, oh, like I'm, I'm just a stereotype. I'm a Chinese woman who likes sweet wine. Um, but I'm curious about how you look at things like that, how the kind of trends in terms of what feels more fashionable or what we think certain people will want to drink. How have you seen that change over time? <laughs> So I think there, there's a couple different things there. Let's let's go on the the kind of easier question. Is that you know the same way that Gallo sets things up in a store, and that other big companies set things up in a store, the same exact thing happens with the styles of wine. So when Irene says you know uh, that the, the the wine may be a little bit sweeter, what happens when you have the sugar in the grape and it goes through alcohol fermentation? In order to make a dry wine, which most wine actually is, you need to ferment out that alcohol. So a lot of still wines, meaning not fortified like port and not bubbly like like a champagne or a sparkling wine. Um, those still wines, most of them from the Northern Hemisphere are going to be around 12 to 15% alcohol. But that Moscato that everyone in this room loves, whether you want to admit it or not, <laughs> is only about 5.5% alcohol because what happens is that by design, they purposely do not ferment out all the sugar. So it's left with something called residual sugar. It's what's left over from fermentation. And that's what keeps it sweet and, and the acid high. So everyone loves sweet. We don't want to 
admitted because we think that sweet is bad because sweet is what we started drinking, whether it's in high school or in college, right? We had that, that box wine, we slapped a bag, make sure we get our money's worth out of that, right? And they do something that's legal in the wine industry is called chapitalization. They can literally add sugar to the fermentation process um, to get the alcohol up and ferment it down, which leaves extra sugar in there, right? Sounds geeky, but it's really not. It's like putting a little bit too much sugar in your coffee, the coffee still stays the same, but your brain and your, and your palate and your brain are focused on the sweetness, but it's still the same level of tannin, that dry acid and acid, and it's still hot, right? But your brain looks at it in such a different way. And that different way is very yummy, right? And the sweetness, we also um, associate it with cheap, right? And so we don't wanna drink cheap wine, but where is cheap wine sold? In cheaper neighborhoods, right? And who typically, lives in cheaper neighborhoods for all of the systemic reasons that we hopefully always talk about and think about. Uh, and so when I came from the distribution side, I see that the people that were salespeople in say Roxbury or Dorchester, they're not, they weren't even wine people. They didn't know about Burgundy. They just knew how to do case drops of Moscato or blue champagne or all of these sweeter wines because that's not what only the distributor but the actual maker of the wine, the supplier, said, well, people in this neighborhood want something cheaper. We can fill it with sugar. It tastes sweet. They don't have to think about it. And that's what happens there. So my goal, and always has been and continues to be, I'm sure we'll get into this, is when you, has anyone ever been to a um, Fernandez Liquors? Okay. People sleep on Fernandez, right? <laughs> they are probably one of the number one alcohol accounts with the distributors in the state of Massachusetts, Wow! right? Because they go in there, you can buy a thousand dollar bottle of tequila, but you can't buy a bottle of wine that's over 26, right? And so it's not that people in those areas can't afford it. It's just that they don't know that Burgundy exists because the buyer of the store doesn't know that Burgundy exists or that all the wine from California is Kendall Jackson and not Progressive Wine Company, which I'll get into you know, later tonight. So the reason why a lot of people drink sweet wine, it's the entrance, it's yummy, it kind of hides all that tannin, but that's what is sold in most of the people's neighborhoods, at least here in the Boston area. And I think that's a very unfair way um, because people are missing out on all these great wines and, and great stories. And then the second part of the question, everyone is what? I don't remember either, but I have okay. another question, which is yeah. even better. So um, I guess, you know, you sort of talk about the the power structure and the taste making kind of going all the way up to the top. It's not, I mean, we think we know what we like and we think we know why we like it, but it actually goes back to the supplier, mm -hmm. the distributor, the manufacturer, the maker. Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen change in the world of winemakers, which is many steps back. Um, and I know that the wines that you've brought here tonight are from some very specific winemakers. And you yourself now are in the business of making wine. Can you tell us a little bit about what that ecosystem looks like? Yeah, totally. So the first part of that, you said we don't know what we like and we don't know why we like it. Um, half of that is wrong, right? Every single person in this room, every single person walking the guy in that tow truck right there has a good palate. Okay, what we don't have is the terminology, the descriptors, right? It's like you taste something, you're like, oh, what is that? And someone's like, apple, and you're like, oh my God, apple, right? But our brains are not made to think that how can apple or how can something like a taste like butter be in Chardonnay, right? It's, it's an it's a, it's a ester, an element called um, uh, diacetol that makes butter taste like butter, right? And the same thing that makes an apple taste like apple or there's something called pyrazine, which makes a, a bell pepper taste like a bell pepper is also in Cabernet Sauvignon, the Cabernet worst. Franc. You don't like it, yeah. I don't like, now I know about Blanc. pyrazines because yeah. I hate them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's one of those things that, Science you know, rules. If, if you can taste something, something's gonna, you're gonna give something a thumb up or a thumb down, right, a thumbs down. And, but if someone says, okay, well describe why you like it. It's like for those of you who have little kids, you know, they, they'll get so frustrated if they can't explain what they're feeling, right? Because they don't have the terminology yet. They can't describe in words what they're saying. But every single one of us feels exactly the same way. All of our palates are the same. Um, some are more focused um, because we're looking for certain things, right? Uh, you have a different palate than me because you're a chef, right? I, I've never worked in the, I've, dishwash, but I've, I'm, I'm not a cooker. I'm an eater and a pair and a drinker, right? So you have all good palates. 
you know, as people grow and get more experiences, your palate changes, right? And I always go back, and I think this will answer your question, and I've been talking about this for years, but I've yet to make, if anyone's a cartoonist, I'd love for someone to just make me one, I'll give you a case of wine. Um, but I talk about how our palates progress over time with experience. And I say, you know, you never start off drinking espresso, right? Here in Boston, uh, you're gonna drink off you know, start off drinking like a donkey's, right? But what's a donkey's, right? It's it's coffee and it's cold and there's a ton of capitalization in there, sugar, and a ton, a ton of malolactic fermentation, lactic acid in there, and you sip it through a straw so it only hits the back part of your palate, right? So you have a, a smaller taste, tasting area, right? We all love that. But then one day you're not gonna get cream in it, you're gonna get either no milk or maybe skim milk and you're like, huh, tastes a little thinner, but I still like the flavor. Right? And then some days you're like, you know what? Doctor wants me to cut down on my sugar, but I'm not gonna cut down on my coffee. So I'm gonna change my sugar up and it changes. So what you do, you end up breaking down this Dunkin' Donuts iced coffee and below all of that makeup, all of that manipulation, you have an espresso, right? But when you add cream to something, it takes the bitterness away. When you take, when you add sugar to something, sweetness, you know, it, it, it makes it actually taste sweeter, right? And when you put ice in something, it makes it cold, right? That sounds silly, but it, yeah, it makes it cold. But what that does is like, actually tonight's a little chilly. If you went outside in a t-shirt tonight, your body will protect itself by closing up the pores and, and giving your arm goosebumps, right? The same exact thing happens in your pal on your palate, in your mouth, that if it's too cold, it closes up the pores, it gives your mouth goosebumps. And what it closes up, it closes up access to your taste buds. So when something's super cold and you, and you taste it, you actually taste much less than if it's warm, okay? So it's not that you don't like the taste of coffee, it's that you don't like the taste of coffee right now because you haven't had experiences like this. So when you change styles of wine or different types of food, different spice levels, acid levels, eventually you're gonna progress your palate. And that's one of the meanings behind our tagline and the name of our book, Drink Progressively. Thank you. And that's also why cold soups need more salt than hot soups. Mm. Chef. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my next question or the next sort of thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is um, representation mm -hmm. in the world of wine, going all the way back to winemakers and then also to people who work on the front lines of the yeah. wine industry. And um, I believe in 2020, Urban Grape launched the Wine Studies Award for people of color. So talk a little bit about what all of that means to you. Yeah, so uh, I'm 44 now, I've been in the wine, food, hospitality, restaurant industry since I was 14. Started as a dishwasher, worked my way up. And I've been particularly in the wine industry for the last 21 years. And during that time, it's pretty much, in, in this city, in this diverse city of Boston, it's pretty much me. There was another woman, her name is Alicia. Uh, she worked at the at the Barbara Lynch Group uh, for, for some time and, and Grill 23 way back in the day. But that was really us for, for wine professionals in the city. And when you say us, you mean And I say black, black people, yeah, okay. right? Yeah, just in um, case. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so, you know, I, I didn't see people sitting at my table that looked like me at Armani Cafe. I didn't see people sitting at my bar when I, I ran a Todd English restaurant, and I didn't see people coming into my store, whether it would be in Chestnut Hill uh, or here in the South End. And why that is is because not many of us look like us in this $50 billion a year industry in North America, $50 billion a year, and only 0.001% of that, of that figure is not even an owner of an alcohol brand, it's upper management. 0.001% of a $50 billion a year industry. And I just got really tired as, you know, we have, you know, we've always been an extreme, we were talking about this, we have a very, we've always been a very female forward company. And, you know, when I had both stores, we had, you know, 45 employees, now I have, I think, 22 employees with one store. So we have a good amount of people there. Always been female forward, always had a, a, a strong population uh, from the LGBTQ plus community, but, and some people from the AAPI community, but not very many black people, right? Or no Latino people, right? And uh, in 2000, in 
uh, 17, I just got fed up because every single time that I got a job application um, for um, for anything, uh, a person of color, uh, usually a guy, uh, both either black or, or Latino, um, would apply for uh, a, a labor position, a delivery position. Um, numerous times they would apply for a stock boy position. Obviously, that's not something that we put out on Indeed or Boston Chefs. We don't look for stock boys, right? But that's what they applied for because that's what they're in their own mind and what society told them was their worth. But every single time I got a white employee or applicant, whether they were 21 years old, right out of school, whether they were 58 years old and has already had a career and they just want to have a passion project, they came in for uh, sales or management because that was their worth. And I just got tired of it. I'm like, here we are trying to be this diverse company and why am I still the only black guy here, right? And so uh, back in the beginning of 2018, my wife Hadley and I uh, reached out to Boston University, to the Met College, and uh, reached out to particularly uh, the Elizabeth Bishop School, which is part of the the, the kind of uh, uh, extended learning gastronomy program here at BU. And uh, and I said, you know, this is this is where I went. And I wanted to make some change, but because of those of you, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna throw accolades to brag about the accolades, but for those of you who don't know us, like we won the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Small Business of the Year last year. We won Ernst & Young's uh, Entrepreneur of the Year Award for New England. Um, we're consistently one of the top 100 stores in the country, and that competes with like the state of Pennsylvania, right? Um, we're wine star enthusiasts. We've been featured in New York Times and and um, Food and Wine Magazine, right? We do a really good job. We run a tight ship. Our numbers are great, and we have a great variety and try to represent everyone. But we did all of that, and I still couldn't get like the validation from this industry, nor could I get people of color to apply. Because if there's only sweet wine in their neighborhood and I sell a ton of Burgundy, I'm not for you. So going up to BU, it's like, this has to change. But because of all those accolades and the level of business that we are, we can't just hire someone to like make the diversity change, right? Like I can't bring someone in and go back to my Armani days and have someone answer your question of like, oh, it's really good. We, we're way past that. If someone comes in, you need to get the answer that you're looking for and you need to get the recommendation that you expect at a store our, our level. So we can't just create jobs that way. We needed to start with education. And with that education became some, con you know, uh, can grow confidence um, in, uh, in what you know. But also because this world is very, the wine world is very snobby, right? It's a very Eurocentric, old, you know, kind of colonist <laughs> industry, right? It's been around forever. Um, you know, with, with, with this, where, where am I going? Sorry, I just want to gra grab my thought for a second. With this right here, that people don't know that this industry exists, and I wanted to change that. So with the education, also became uh, an opportunity to create practical work experience because the small, uh, here's, here's where I am, all the sommeliers with the pins and all the fancy restaurants, a lot of them like to hear themselves talk. You're like, hey, I wanna know, is this gonna be good with my steak? And they're like, well, you know, the light hail in the end of August with this Riesling grip, and you're like, is this gonna taste good with my meal tonight, right? I'm spending my time and my energy and thought on this. And so I wanted to create education, which is kind of useless by itself. I wanted to create practical work experience on the four, on the three sides of the wine industry that I've been in, retail, wholesale, and and, uh, and restaurants. And then I also wanted to create um, not only mentorship, ongoing mentorship, but coaching, right? They're two different things. And uh, we ended up coming up with a fourth internship, uh, making wine. So our students go through a one-year um, uh, internship, I'm sorry, a one-year um, wine education at BU for free. And at the same time, they work with us for three months, Row 34 for three months, MS Walker for three months, and then they go out to Sonoma and uh, make our wine uh, and learn how to farm and, and grow grapes and make wine. And on top of that, they get our network because that's what so many of us miss, right? It's that it's that round of golf that, oh, oh you, you need to get an interview? I'm not going to get you the job, but I'll get you the interview right? There's the getting to know someone in your industry, which doesn't exist for people like us. So we ended up raising in 2020, after two and a half years of trying to start this program, we couldn't figure out the money, right? We have two kids, we're small business owners, we make a little extra money, what do we do? We reinvest it into our business, to try to grow our business. Um, but what we needed to do was start to fund this program. Uh, 
it took two years until someone, uh, right after the murder of George Floyd, said, hey, you know what? This sounds like a great program. I want to do that. And, and so BU called us and, and said, hey, we, f we have funding. I know we've been working on this for two years. And I said, this is amazing. And they're like, well, there's a couple caveats here. Um, one, the gentleman uh, doesn't want Urban Grape's name attached to it. Uh, nor could the name of the award uh, say anything about people of color on it. Yowza. Uh, what's that? Yowza. Yep. And he wanted it uh, not to be an award, which was selective, uh, but rather be a scholarship, which is only financially um, uh, a financial requirement, which we didn't want because the, the, the black woman whose dad is a, is, a, is a lawyer and mom's a plastic surgeon is still looked at in a different way than the 21 year old uneducated, you know, kid from, you know, Brookline, right? Uh, who, who would be white. And, you know, so with that, so I got, I got pissed, right? And, you know, there was, uh, you know, it's now down to a flashlight in our industry and in many industries. But during that, that June of 2020, uh, we had a ton of customer support. People were like, you know what, we're gonna support you with our, with our energy and our thought and our, and our dollar. And we grew our business substantially through that. And we appreciate it for everyone in our community, right? They helped build us up. Um, and so with the extra funds coming in, we, we started this program ourselves. We're like, you know what, we're not gonna give this guy the satisfaction of patting himself on the on the back and said, "Look what I did for people of color." He did. He didn't deserve that. So we took another chance and tightened our belts and and we started this. And so the Urban Grape Wine Studies Award for Students of Color at BU, we raised uh, almost a quarter of a million dollars in eight months. No corporate asks by design because we didn't want to let corporations get out for a small amount of money. What this does, it puts two students through this program for one year in perpetuity. So we're now currently on cohort three. Uh, cohort Amazing. one, both got six figure jobs. Um, and one even got relocated to, to Napa Valley. And so that is that immediate change. And, I, and I'll finish with this, that, um, you know, what we realized is that the, the, the pipeline wasn't broken in this industry for people of color, the pipeline didn't exist. And so if we can create education, practical work experience, mentorship, coaching network, that's gonna be this organic change, which will take time. Currently, we're doing it two students at a time, right? We're working, currently working with the United Negro College Fund to try to tap into some HBCUs and really grow this on the national level and turn it into a 501c3. But that's where we are right now. So we're, we're really changing industry one, one vintage at a time. That's incredible. I mean, effectively, you are doubling and tripling representation totally. of people of color who yeah. work in wine in the city yeah. of Boston. Yeah, um, and, and, and 20 years ago, this conversation was about women in wine, right? This is, this, is, this is not just a people of color. This is everything except for the traditional white middle-aged sommelier from Europe, right? right? That's what it is. This conversation was 20 years ago, was a woman. There are way more women in wine and winery owners and makers and sommeliers and directors and retail shop owners. And it's really great to see, but it's the same conversation. Right. We have a great question from an audience member, which is what can consumers do to better support black, indigenous, and people of color owned wine businesses? And maybe I'll add to that, is there anyone in Boston who you'd like to shout out, maybe who's a sommelier or a business owner who's doing something really exciting with wine? Yeah, so it's an awesome question, whoever asked that question. Um, you know, I've used our platform and our network to help build other people up. When I say, you know, 13, 14 years ago when we wrote our business plan that we wanted to help build community through beverage. Um, it's also the community that is not just the customer. It's the community of, of the winemaker, the wine grower, right? The importer, exporter. And over the years, and really this, I've always tried, but here's the thing, you know, like we, did, we as people of color in this industry also didn't have a big network, right? right? And through, you know, the murder of George Floyd, where there was a focus and all these lists started coming up about, you know, being black or brown in this industry or, you know, whatever. Um, we actually got to know each other throughout. Like it, it opened up the network that none of us knew that we existed. And mind you, I said, I've been doing this for a long time now. And there are people, unfortunately, not a lot in Massachusetts or in New England, but there are people like in Atlanta or Dallas or Chicago or or the, um, the 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 Bay Area that have been wine shop owners and and winemakers 
for 10, 15, 20 years, but no one's ever heard about them. Why, right? So the best, and so what I've done, I've been able to talk to distributors, uh, and because we're on a three-tier system here, so I, can, I can't buy from a winery, I have to buy from a wholesaler, um, but I have to make that introduction with the wholesaler to the winery. And so we've been able to bring in um, dozens of, uh, of BIPOC owned and made brands. And for those of you who've been to the store, we're small, we're only 2,000 square feet, right? but we sell more BIPOC owned and made um, alcohol brands than anyone in the Northeast, right? I'm very proud of that, but I'm also kind of sick and how come I sell more Latina made wines than Total Wine? Why? We care more, right? It's the intentionality of what we're trying to do. So how can you support those brands support by buying, right? The easiest way to support any kind of cause is not only with your dollar, that's the, that's the fastest way, but also with your thought, you know, Instagram something, tag them, right? We have the power of social media, right? To let other people know that Kita exists or PWC exists or House of Brown, which we'll be tasting tonight, um, exists. I think that's the easiest way. And I think the shout out would honestly be to someone like you. I mean, what you do in this industry um, is absolutely remarkable and it's not just for people of color, it's for every single person, right? Like you help create access and equity. This, she's fantastic. If you don't even know what she's doing, but, <laughs> um, but you're doing really great stuff. And I, I really think that when other people see what other people are doing well, they want to gravitate towards them, right? And when good energy is coming out, so I, I would say whoever asked that question, you know, spread the love, ask questions, go visit a, a, a BIPOC um, business or a retail shop, or, you know, we had five black South African winemakers come to the store. You were there uh, two weeks ago. We had 400 people come through my space, Wow! right? And these South Africans, have never seen anything like that. Mm. And people didn't come for TJ, right? I don't work in the store. I haven't worked in the store in two years, right? They came to support them, right? And that's what's important is to understand the difference. You're not supporting the urban grape. You're supporting all the stories and the families that the urban grape can represent. I read this great interview um, that Hadley did with you. Your wife interviewed you. Oh, that one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and... Um, <laughs> You know, you talked about the murder of George Floyd, with, which now is about a little over two years mm -hmm. ago. Um, I'm wondering if you can share just a little bit about what that moment changed in your perspective and your experience of being a black man in wine. And I guess two words that I'll throw out there is um, sort of tokenization, yeah. because that's complicated, and also the ideas that we have around merit. Um, which affects how I think, you know, a lot of people of color who are trying to fight their way through a space struggle. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us just a little bit about what that was like? Yeah, I think your, your, your question is always going to be relevant, right? Um, but it doesn't just have to be within the wine or hospitality industry. It's in right. every single industry on this planet. And I'll start with a story, so it was after the um, the you know after the peaceful protests. I always like to you know to preface the peaceful protests um, that night was it May May thirty first maybe right um, the peaceful protest after all the peaceful protesters for social justice went home there were riots right and they were riots we talked to the D four police afterwards and what they ended up finding around the city I don't even know if this was publicized but they ended up finding. Um, uh, bags of like sledgehammers and bolt cutters and stuff like that all spread out throughout the city because this was kind of like a planned attack, right? To, to, to vandalize and, and steal, right? And so there were two separate issues. That night, um, as people, Hadley and I uh, live in JP and we're, we're sitting on our couch just watching this, so being like, TJ, like, should you go into the store? I'm like, I'm not going to the store. I'm not going into the city right now. As a black man right now, I'm not going to the city. And, you know, we're, she's, we're sitting there and we're just watching this and now it's probably like 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning and just so frightened for the city that we both love, right? And the, and the city that we're community members in, right? And so we're sitting there and we're watching this and, you know, Hadley starts crying and, and, and I'm holding back like emotion. And, you know, she's, and I said, you know, I said to her, I said, like, sweet, it's like, we have insurance, right? Like it's it's just stuff, right? Everything's replaced. Nobody's in the store. We're safe right now. Our staff is safe right now. Everything's gonna 
be okay for this evening. I'll go in in the morning. And so we turn the TV off. You know, we're, we're glad that we don't live in the city uh, anymore because we lived right near the store for, for many years in the South End. And that next morning, Hadley gets a text from someone who lives across the street from us on Columbus from the stores. And it's a, it's a picture of our storefront with our window broken through. And so Hadley wakes me up at like, know, like five o'clock in the morning. I'm like, oh no. So I get in there and you guys saw me come on stage. I'm a, I'm a big guy. Uh, and I go in there, um, you know, I, have, I don't make coffee. I don't have breakfast. You know, I chug maybe probably some emergency and I drive into the city and I have a parking spot in the garage under Equinox. And so I park in there. And I, I come out and I'm wearing like uh, um, uh, like camo cargo shorts and like maybe like my, my drink progressively t-shirt and like some ones. And I go in there and the concierge for the building that, that the Urban Grape is in is um, standing in front of the door and he pokes his head through the window to see if like anyone's in there. And, uh, and he's wearing a suit and young, young white guy um, wearing a suit and he looks in. And so then I look in and I'm like, the alarm never went off because I get alerted if something happens on, from my phone. And so I, I go in and I climb through the window. And the moment I climb through the window, the alarm goes off. And my phone was busy or something. And so ADT calls our secondary number, our home number, and my wife picks up the phone. And Hadley's never worked in the store, right? So she has no idea what the security code is for, for the pin pad or the verbal password. Um, she does now, thank God. But, um, and the woman's like, you know, Miss, you know, Miss Douglas, I, I, I need to know the, the security because police have been dispatched. And she said, please do not send the police. My husband is a black man standing in a broken in liquor store after a riot, right? And like e even that right there, right? And so, luckily, I was able. To, and and the 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 woman on ADT, uh, uh, the security company, she started crying. She's like, "Miss, I'm so sorry. I understand." And so then I'm like, "Oh, I got to turn the alarm off." So I, you know, I kind of snapped too, and I turned the alarm off. And she goes, "Miss Douglas, the alarm was just thing. The cops have been, you know, called off." And my wife said she's never been so scared in her life. For me, it was just like, no, no, no. I knew because how I was raised, I am a black, I knew that I was a black man standing in a broken liquor store after a riot, right? So when I walked through my store window and that alarm was on, I already had my ID and my business card in my hand to prove that I own that store. I shouldn't have to do that, right? But that's what that was like there. And immediately we got so much attention, some was, some was uh, amazing attention, which has continued to this day from our from our community. Some people didn't know that we existed, right? Because they take a left out of their house instead of a right, and so like, and we don't advertise, right? So it grew our business uh, and grew our community exposure there. But what it also did, it put Urban Grape, which at this point, you know, has been around for nine years, uh, on a national spotlight because we were front page of the New York Times, um, like food section or whatever whatever section it was, and it was about four or five of us around the country that are in the restaurant and wine space um, that were black. And it was basically an article, it was like, how does it feel to be black in this industry? And we're like, and all of us were like, well, we've always been black in this industry. Now, like now, now you're seeing us, right? And so for a long time, for a few months, it was, I mean, we were NPR, national, like radio, New York Times, all these places were writing about us. And I got to a point, I'm like, and this is like the tokenism, right? Like, I, can we just talk about wine again? Like I was so done about talking about how it was to be black. Cause I've, at this point I've been black for 42 years, right? It's not just, I'm not black now. It's just that you may, may see me this way now, right? And so it was really tough. And then I had to lean into it. And I saw that I had this opportunity as the world watches me and others because of the horrible tragedy it's bringing light that this is our opportunity to lean into it. And out of all the tra tragedy, bring something amazing. Mm -hmm. And that's when we kicked off this program that we were trying to do for, for two years. And we talk about it all the time with our kids, you know, like we're in an interracial relationship and one kid identifies as mixed race and the other one identifies as black, right? And so we talk about this stuff at our home on a daily basis, you know, but not like in a, old school, like John Singleton, like this is a lesson, you know, just in conversation. And it's a conversation that everyone should have in their daily life. Thank you for sharing. Oh, you're that. welcome.
I remember when that happened um, and and you shared about it at the time. Um, and I think what's really exciting for me as someone who hasn't felt totally comfortable in the world of wine, I let my white husband do the work there. Um, who, wor who worked with me for, yes, for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why he has all these great books yeah. that I'll never read. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I think that there is now a really, a, a much broader conversation about eliminating white supremacy in wine, about decolonizing wine, about not saying it tastes like gooseberries anymore, because right. like, who's had a gooseberry? Um, or, or brioche, or, or what have you, or using gendered language. Miguel de Leon, his piece about um, decolonizing wine, won a mm -hmm. James Beard Award this past mm -hmm. year. And so I think that this broader conversation is so applicable to what's happening everywhere. And to see it happen in wine is really inspiring. Yeah, absolutely. So, who did anyone come to? I think you were there, and maybe one of you got. Did you guys go to the South African wine tasting? So it was you were there. If you all had the opportunity to meet Tanashi Niamudoka, Tanashi Niamudoka makes a great one, uh, many wines called Kamusha, and currently this guy is uh, is competing for the number one sommelier in the world. Right, he's actually competing in I think two or three weeks, and uh, Tanashi, who's been to South Africa before, okay. Um, they're really big on the caste system, unfortunately, and you know the caste system, right? Um, it's all based based on uh, skin tone. So you have you have white, colored, which is like my my skin tone, and then black, and it's the hierarchy, right? They do it in India, they do it in South Africa, many other places in in, uh, in Africa, mostly in South Africa, and uh, and Tanashi is a black man, so he's in the lowest tier of class, but he's lower than that because what is lower? in that class section in most countries, right? It's not the darkest person or the poorest person, it's the immigrant, right? So Tanashi is not even South African, he's, he's a Zimbabwean. And, and he came to South Africa as an immigrant, I think as like 14 or 15 years old, couldn't get a job as a dishwasher, so he was a silverware polisher, right? Fast forward, I don't know, a dozen years, he became the number one sommelier on the continent of Africa. Right? But what he had to do, he had to understand flavors and descriptors in wines because he actually uses it as a reference. He's like, I didn't have a gooseberry <laughs> in Zimbabwe. Right. Right. We didn't have, um, I don't know, kind of think of, you know, we didn't have clementines, right? So if clementine is a descriptor uh, of, of a food or, or ta a tasting note, but you've never had what a clementine tastes like or smells like or the zest or the oil or the feel or, or the texture, how can you ever describe it? And so he had to train himself to understand a different language right? and then how to translate that to the world. And so his brand, Kamusha, stands for uh, like roots of origin or home. And the wines are really wonderful. And he, it's kind of his mission of kind of tasting these flavors. And this and this is what I've always done, but I just did it because I, I, I thought it was a, a simple and easy way to have a conversation about something that's very intimidating, which is wine, uh, of what are you tasting, right? And I always start off with whatever you say, you are correct. Why? Because you have a great palate. And if you taste something and something reminds you of something, who am I or anyone else in the world to tell you that you're wrong? If you think this tastes like peanut butter, bless you, then it tastes like peanut butter. Well, let's talk about what do you think peanut butter tastes like, right? And so it's that whole thing. So Tanache and a lot of um, people that are, are, are making wines, and when you're a winemaker and you have access, you might be from Southern California, but if you have access and financial access, you're able to do harvest all over the world in places like New Zealand where they have gooseberries. Right, and so you'll be able to learn that, but if you don't have that access, you don't have the terminology or the vocabulary to do it. Right. Wow. So how do we change that? Taste more. Your tasting note should be your tasting note, right? And that's it. Yeah. I usually just say it tastes like grapes. Um, yeah. And there are grapes in there, so I think yeah, I'm, I'm But there's only like two concerned. wines that actually taste like grapes. <laughs> that's right. Out of all the wines. <laughs> so this is such a great conversation, TJ. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. I'm wondering if we can just close with you saying a couple words about the wines um, that are available for tasting here tonight. Yeah, sure. So uh, 
we have two wines that I, that I chose for this evening. Um, the second one is something called House of Brown. And House of Brown is a young black woman. Uh, her name is Coral Brown. And she grew up in Napa Valley. She was the only person of color besides her siblings in the Napa Valley High School, right? Uh, her family to this day are the only, even with all the NBA stars going there and making wine, they're the only family that ha that has a black owned estate in Napa Valley. Uh, it's on the other side of the tracks, you know, not on the not on the on the main like Silverado or 29. Um, it's uh, over by Lake Hennessy on the right side, and. Uh, and her dad uh, was a, a doctor, um, ran, ran some free clinics uh, in the late 60s before free healthcare was around, ran free clinics, uh, and that actually goes right into what I was talking about, the language. Um, they ran free clinics, and he had people on staff that could understand 20 languages, because those are the people in his community. And so if you wanted healthcare, but you couldn't explain what was wrong, you didn't get healthcare. So he wanted to make sure to have that descriptor, to have that terminology. Um, his, uh, his kind of weekend home away therapy was buying an old rundown farm on the outskirts of Napa Valley in the late 1980s. Um, he started messing around with growing grapes, started staging or, or like apprenticing in other places, and just really um, found a love for it and started growing Zinfandel that was so good that all the places that he apprenticed at started actually buying his grapes. Uh, and then in the mid '90s, they made their first um, wine called Brown Fa uh, Brown uh, Family Vineyards. Uh, so they're in Napa Valley. And how I heard about this was at this massive party in Oak Bluffs in OB in uh, in Martha's Vineyard, where has a, has always had a very large uh, Black summer population and kind of full time population. And they s um, sought out Black owned brands over the years, and so I actually learned about this from some black customers on the vineyard from Maryland that were vacationing, right? So we brought Brown in, and Brown kind of took off here uh, at the Urban Grape a couple years ago, and it they started selling more wine after, after 2020, and it allowed Coral to leave the family business and start her own business, which is what House of Brown is tonight, which is 80% Cabernet, 20% Pinot Noir, which is kind of an interesting blend, but the Cab is gonna bring structure and fruit and yumminess, and the Pinot is gonna add some acid to kind of keep it fresh. Um, so we're drinking that, it's 2021. And where on the scale is that? So that is a 7R. So where that sits, that sits where a lot of Merlot is, uh, maybe some really heavy Cote de Rhone's, like, Grenache, um, either, either from the Rhone Valley or like Spain. Uh, and then our wine, Progressive Wine Company, and shockingly, we got PwC trademark because we're a different uh, industry than Price Waterhouse, which is awesome. So um, so we own the PwC trademark. Shockingly, our lawyers are like, wait, did we just really do that for you? Um, but uh, we made uh, three wines this year, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Noir Rosé, all from the Russian River Valley in Sonoma. And we have a winemaker who is also the mentor to our cohorts. Uh, and so I mentioned that they make this wine. And I wanted to do something intentional and very specific. Uh, most of these brands that come out, it's very easy. Any one of you could start a wine brand. You can buy excess juice, design a label, put it on there, pay the winery that sold you the bottles to go to the, the Alcohol Bureau of Tobacco and Firearms, and boom, you have a wine and you can sell it direct to consumer or to your friends. Super easy, you can do it tomorrow, right? The other way to do it is to buy excess juice that hasn't been bottled yet and blend it yourself, right? So you're kind of blending more like a what's called a negotiant, um, or you do it the old-fashioned way, which is what we do, where uh, I'm actually learning from this guy, so I'm being mentored right now, um, about how to actually um, buy grapes and work with growers and sign contracts and learn how to design a label, which Hadley actually does, um, and, buy, um, and buy glass and corks and stuff like this. So we want it to be very intentional. It's very easy to go buy you know, a ton of grapes from Gallo, right? They own most of California. But what we wanted to do, we wanted to be able to use our platform to again build up. So our Sauvignon Blanc is from a Mexican American guy um, named Juan uh, Gamino uh, in Santa Rosa, California, and he grows Great Sauvignon Blanc, which you'll, which you'll uh, taste tonight. But what's important, if we have uh, a moment, um, is that Juan's story, Juan's, I'd say Juan's probably about my age, uh, and people are banging down his door because he's got like the sickest vineyards. But no one knew about him, and, and no one knew about this area, and he wanted to find something himself, and he didn't have a lot of uh, capital to do it. So he's a great farmer. He comes from a farming family. 
as I mentioned, he's first generation Mexican. Uh, his mom and dad were in Mexican uh, or in Mexico uh, for many generations. They were business owners. They owned their own farm. They owned their own land. But guess what they did in the 1970s, early 80s? They sold their land, which many people like that's the legacy, right? It's how you say the easiest way to create wealth is to inherit it, right? And what's the easiest way to inherit something is through land, right? They sold all of their land and their family business to move to the United States to have a better life. But what was a better life for them out of owning their own business in Mexico and their own land? They became pickers. So they left their business and their land and they picked almonds and walnuts and grapes. And they had enough to send the kids to school and clothe them and stuff like that. But Juan and his, and his brothers and sisters grew up in this industry. And so now Juan owns an awesome piece of land, and now he has the right to say no when someone comes in, a developer or a big company, and wants to buy it. And so here, Juan's legacy is, is that he's now owning land for his family. And he's like, I'm never gonna sell this, you know? Um, and so what we like about using him and using other people for the wines is that it has that, even if it's not a, even if you don't know that story, it's important to me, you know, and it's important to Juan to know that we're producing a great wine and we're selling that wine to great people and it has a story, but also that our, our students, you know, make that wine with our winemaker and a dollar from every bottle uh, at the winery level, so before it comes to Massachusetts, um, goes in to the fund to support next year's students. So, you know, this year it's like $1,400. It's not a lot. It will pay for their you know, their, uh, their car rental that I, that Hadley and I pay for it now, their car rental for, for a couple months. But in two years, when we're making about 600 cases, now you're putting about $40,000 a year into this program. And so in 10 years, when the winery is doing $12 million, we're now funding hundreds of students through this program that are all paid for. Um, and hopefully, as I said, HBCUs and some of these kids, kids, some are 30 years old, but, um, but can go to South Africa and meet all these amazing people and really change the wine world on a global scale. And since we're doing this very organically, um, to me, that's the proof of sustainability. So this is not going anywhere into, you know, with our partnership with Boston University, this is an endowment, it's here forever, so. This is just the beginning. This is just the beginning. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, TJ, and that's a two W on our scale. Two W. Yep. Got it. Two dubs. Thank you so much Thank for you. being here. May we have a round of applause, please, for TJ Douglas? And we'll turn it back over to Amy. You were one of you were one of the best talkers that have ever been on this stage. You are a great talker and. <laughs> Different. Different. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Who will be here on November 29th. Yep. But thank you so much and all the work you do and fighting the good fight and really making communities stronger. And yeah, th this was wonderful. Uh, I can't wait to eat this food. I can't wait to taste this wine. I also forgot to mention Curated Cuisine is a partnership with BU Food and Wine, which is just a wonderful, wonderful partner. Just a quick um, plug for Thursday is the opening of the Cambridge Science Festival. And on Thursday night here, we have an artist from Switzerland who is recreating the Northern Lights over MIT and Kendall Square. And he's going to talk about how he's doing. It's going to be amazing. But for the time being, let's go eat and drink and buy this book. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.